Let's imagine you've gone ahead and done an experiment. You've put people in different conditions, you've measured some outcome variables, and now it's time to analyze the data. As we said earlier, there are two ways in which you analyze experimental data. One is called an analysis of variance. The second one is regression. What we'll do in the next segment is to see how we can interpret the results of experiments. In order to do that, I want to keep going back to the experiment that we talked about earlier, Gorville's experiment on the pennies a day phenomena. Remember the first experiment that we talked about? In this experiment, people were either exposed to a $350 a year or a dollar a day frame. Here's what Gorville found. He found that when people saw the same amount expressed as dollars a day, they were much more hired, uh, they were much more willing to donate than when they saw the aggregate frame. And in fact, what you see is that the green bar, in this case representing pennies a day, is taller than the gray bar. That is an example of what we call a main effect. In this case, one factor, which is the framing of the payment, has a main effect, consistent effect, on the outcome, which in this case is willingness to donate. Now let's look at the second experiment that we talked about. In this case, we had a fully crossed experiment. We looked at pennies a day framing versus aggregate framing, but we did that under two conditions, under a low amount condition and a high amount condition. Here's what you see in terms of the results. On the left-hand side, we see the data for the low amount condition. And what you see here is a replication of the first study. Namely, people in the pennies a day condition actually were much more willing to donate than people in the aggregate condition. But let's look at the right-hand side panel. That's the panel where the amounts were high. And notice what happens there. In that condition, we see a reversal of the basic effect. In other words, we find that people who saw the pennies a day condition actually were less likely to donate than people who saw the aggregate condition. So if you look at the big picture, this is what is happening. The effect of one variable, in this case, the pennies a day framing, on the willingness to donate changes as a function of the presence of a second variable, in this case, whether the amount is high or a low. Every time you have a situation where the effect of one variable on the uh, final outcome changes as a function of the presence of a second variable, we're going to call that an interaction effect. So once again, a main effect is when a given variable has a consistent effect on the outcome variable, an interaction effect when the effect of variable one changes as a function of the presence or absence of a second variable. Let's think through the notion of interaction effects a bit more closely. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and hypothesize three imaginary experiments that John Gorville could have done in his study on pennies a day. Here's the first one. Let's imagine we take one condition, which is the pennies a day framing, versus a second condition, which is the aggregate framing. Now we replicate this experiment in a second product context. So what we now have is a fully cross design, two products times two levels of price framing. In this context, we might see results that look like that. On the left-hand side, you see that for product one, the pennies a day results in a greater willingness to donate than the aggregate. On the right-hand side, for product two, we see the same exact effect. In this case, there is no interaction effect, but simply a strong main effect of the way in which you frame the amount, pennies a day versus aggregate. Here's a second situation. This is really not hypothetical, but it is basically a graph drawn from the experiment that we talked about earlier. Shows that when the amount is low, pennies a day dominates. When the amount is high, the aggregate frame dominates. In this case, the presence of the second variable has reversed the original effect, resulting in an interaction effect. Here's a third kind. Let's imagine that this experiment was done not so much with amounts, but with two different kinds of people. For example, let's say in one condition, we showed people who were monthly wage earners uh, and put them in two conditions, the aggregate versus pennies a day. In a second group, we took people who were daily wage earners and then again did the same thing all over again with them. 
Here's a simple theoretical prediction. If people are earning wages on a daily basis, they are much more likely to compute the daily impact of an aggregate product anyways. And therefore, for those people, we expect that there would be no difference between framing as pennies a day versus framing as an aggregate expense. In fact, this is what our results might show us. On the left panel, for monthly wage earners, we would replicate the earlier finding. Pennies a day does better than aggregate. But on the right panel, what we would find is that there is no difference between the two types of price framing. This is an interaction effect, but one in which the, effect, uh, in which the basic effect disappears when you introduce a second variable. So in sum, there are many ways in which you could get interaction effects. An effect could be stronger or weaker as a result of a second variable, or it could completely reverse and finally even be eliminated as the second variable is introduced into the experiment. Let's finally end by looking at how you would interpret regression coefficients if you use regression to analyze your experimental data. Remember that in the regression setting, your final output is an equation that might look something like y is some constant a plus b1 multiplied by the first variable plus b2 multiplied by the second variable, and so on and so forth. Every time you run a, run a regression model, the first thing to keep in mind is that if the model shows you that certain coefficients are not statistically significant, you need not consider them in your interpretation of the results. When you read a paper, you will typically find that statistically significant coefficients have a asterisk or a star marked next to them. The ones that are not significant do not have an asterisk or a star. The second thing that you need to keep in mind uh, is, is to look at how we think about capturing interaction effects in a regression setting. ANOVA does it by simply looking at each of the two factors as separate independent factors when it runs its model. In a regression setting, let's imagine you have two variables x1 and x2. How do I capture the interaction between the two? Here's what I do. I would normally model y as a function of a plus b1 times x1, plus b2 times x2, and then I would simply multiply x1 and x2 and give it a separate coefficient of its own, in this case, b3. And if you ran a model like this and came up with a regression coefficient, which was significant in b3, then you would say that you had a significant interaction effect in a regression sense.